<laughs> uh, welcome everybody um, to tonight's uh, meeting of the Astronomical Society. Um, and tonight we've got um, Bruce who's going to give us a talk on Thomas Henderson, the first Astronomer Royal for Scotland. Uh, for visitors who are joining us on YouTube, uh, you can follow the Society and, and what we do in a variety of ways. The best way is our website um, where you'll get a link to the YouTube channel that we have. And most of the talks that we've given during the lockdown period are available there for everyone to see. Uh, please feel free to make use of it. Um, and the next slide, Mark, please. Thanks. Um, just a reminder about what's coming up. Um, on Friday, we have Professor David Waltham, uh, Is Earth Special? Um, that should be a really good talk. On the following Wednesday on the 22nd, we've got the uh, uh, NASA's um, Mission Science Senior Scientific Officer, uh, Noah Rafi, um, who's joining us from Maryland. Um, so that again should be a really exciting talk. And then um, almost the pinnacle on the 24th, we've got, uh, we've got uh, Mark giving us an introduction to astroimaging part five. And that's the well, imaging that's science. Part, no more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, uh, that should be fun. And um, at the moment, we've just said on the last session, if you'd like for this term, because we're going to have August off, uh, during which time we'll decide the frequency of uh, future meetings now that lockdown is, is coming to a close. Um, and on the Friday the 31st, um, uh, I think Mark is going to give us the sky in August. Um, and we've got a sort of end of term catch up. So we can have a good chat about uh, what we've done and, uh, and what we think of the shows that we've put on. Uh, with that, um, I think I can hand over to uh, to Bruce um, for tonight's talk. If you want to share your screen, Bruce. Yes, we'll try to do that. Excellent. Any any uh, questions as normal? If you um, if you're on Zoom, put them in the chat box, and I'll pick them up. If you're looking on YouTube, put them in the comments section, and we'll try and pick them up from there. Thank you, and over to you, Bruce. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, and Andrew, and welcome everybody to a talk which I should have called The Hidden History of Edinburgh. Nobody knows what goes on up there or what went on. Now, over on the right here on this first slide is an image that you will be told is an image of Thomas Henderson. The story on that one is that when Piazzi Smythe came to Edinburgh in 1846, he had never met Henderson and he wanted to know what Henderson looked like. And he asked people to give him examples and so on. And he, he was a very good uh, artist, was uh, Piazzi Smythe. And so he drew images and got people to point to the one that looked like Henderson. And that's, well, I say that's the one. That one was redrawn about 100 years later. So when you see, when you're told that that's Thomas Henderson, just think carefully about it. Now, here's a, what is already becoming a historical photograph, like the one that we had on the beginning. And here is what is what was called the Royal Observatory of King George IV, because that was its official name, and that's why it has royal astronomers, of which Thomas Henderson was the first. The only other building that comes into Henderson's life on this hill here is this little building in the trees here, and I have a better image of it later, called the Transit House. Those are the only two buildings that are associated with his life. The one way to the left here, the house, that is associated with astronomy, and that was the first building on the hill, actually, but he didn't have anything to do with it. And the one over here that looks like a, a grandiose uh, astronomical observatory, that was built in 1896, after the Royal Observatory had gone to Blackford Hill. So let's have a look at Hen Henderson's early years. He was born in Dundee uh, on 28th of uh, December 1798, and he was the youngest of five children. In fact, there were two boys and three girls, and the three girls were in the middle. And the other son was called John, and he was just about 10 years older than Thomas. But he figures in Thomas's life uh, quite strongly. He entered Dundee Academy. Uh, he'd been to a primary school somewhere before, and I don't know where that was, but he entered Dundee Academy for the end of his education in 1811. And the head of Dundee Academy in later years was known to say that 
the two Henderson boys, that's John and Thomas, were the brightest two pupils that he'd ever uh, taught. Henderson came out in 1814. Now, their father had died when Henderson was young, and there was an imperative to look after the mother and the three sisters. And so he had to go into work immediately. And he went into business with his son, uh, brother John, who'd set up a legal um, company in Dundee when he'd come out of school with a partner. Now, John, um, who was an exceptionally accomplished uh, legal person, actually went to Edinburgh, but I don't have the date for that. Uh, but in 1820, the better pickings in Edinburgh, of course, than in Dundee. In 1820, he convinced his younger brother Thomas to come to Edinburgh because he could get Thomas all sorts of really good jobs. And I'll mention one of them, but not going through the lot. And he was 12 years in Edinburgh before ultimately he became a professional astronomer. And it was during those 12 years between 1820, there's a little bit of fuzziness here. Some people state 1819. Um, but these 12 years here between 1819 and 1831, that was when he was learning about astronomy but also when he was publishing some very rich papers at the same time, as we'll see. Here's the one uh, job that I'm going to tell you about. All of the uh, archives for Carlton Hill are up on Blackford Hill these days, and you can go and see them if you ask nicely. And this is Lord Eldon's, uh, this was the biggest job that Henderson had in the legal industry before he became an astronomer. He was secretary to Lord Eldon, and he was given this book here, which is still in existence, and I photographed, and he had to write what Lord Eldon was doing in that book as he followed Lord Eldon around. And this was such a good job, by the way, that he got a pension of 100 pounds a year for life out of this job, even though he was in it for, in it for a couple of years. And that was enough to live off in, in those days. But here we see, I've opened the book up at these two pages here. And on the left here, this is Lord Eldon's debates. This is information about what Lord Eldon was doing. On the right, you'll probably be able to see that there's huge amounts of numbers here. This is his astronomy, because he was living a double life here. He was learning about astronomy while he was doing the job, and he would turn the book over and work from the back while he was doing his astronomy. And if you ever get to see this book and open it up, about three quarters of it is astronomy, and one quarter was the job that he was doing. And I've got a small piece of maths here at the side, but that's not really uh, of interest to us tonight. Now, the context of astronomy, let me go back to the context of astronomy, which I also showed in my speed of light talk, because this is so important to what Henderson was doing. Although Henderson didn't come on stream until about 150 years after King Charles set up Greenwich, the job was still the same. And that job as specified by King Charles II, and I'll read it out, was to apply himself with the most exact care and diligence to the rectifying of the tables of the motions of the heavens and the places of the fixed stars, so as to find out the so much desired longitude of places for perfecting the art of navigation. Two things, the two first two red things I've got in there, that describes Henderson to a T. He assiduously measured the heavens and made stellar atlases on and on and on, that was his big thing. But he also assiduously studied longitude and he was very interested right to his in the longitude difference between Edinburgh, Carlton Hill and Greenwich. And I've highlighted perfecting the art of navigation as well because the imperative for setting up these astronomical observatories all around the country was to give navigators a time service from the heavens. So they didn't have to go to Greenwich to find out what the time was. They could come to any port, Port of Leith, come up to Carlton Hill, and there was a time service there. And Henderson would have been involved in that in those 12 years that he was on the hill before he became an astronomer uh, in his own right. And I want to now talk some, about some elements of astronomy so we understand better what it was that Henderson and other astronomers of that era were up to. I'll start with the transit house. That's the little um, hut that was in the, in the corner of the photograph I showed earlier. It did have a slit up and over the roof, which is not in this image, but you'll find that it's been reinstated uh, when they rebuilt the site. Because inside that 
transit house was this telescope, and we believe this is the exact telescope on which Henderson learned astronomy. It's in the possession of the council. And you can see that that telescope's on an axle, axle. So it can only move in one direction. And that direction followed this slit up and over here, and it's exactly north-south. It's on the meridian, very precisely. Because when you want to measure stars, and particularly the longitude of the stars, which is called right ascension, you need a clock and you need to write down when that star crosses the meridian from east to west. And that's called a transit. It's transiting the meridian, which is where the words come from. And so if you've got an accurate clock inside your observatory, as each star comes past, you write down the time and that's one of your coordinates for the star. The other coordinate declination, which is related to latitude, I don't talk about tonight. Um, now, William Wallace, was professor of mathematics at the University of Edinburgh when Henderson arrived around 1819, 1820. And he became professor because the previous professor died in the year 1819. But I don't know whether they deliberately picked Wallace because he was interested in astronomy um, or it was just good luck, but he associated himself with what was going on on Carlton Hill instantly. And he took the young Henderson under his wing. It's not known when Henderson became interested in astronomy. There's a sort of story when he was a young lad in Dundee, he dabbled a bit about the age of seven or something. And I don't know the exact date. That's why I've got a question mark there. We know that the pair of them were in Edinburgh by 1820, but I don't know exactly when uh, Wallace started to train Henderson inside this uh, transit house here with these instruments. Uh, incidentally, Henderson would recognize this clock in case only. The uh, workings have been changed several times since Henderson used it. And it's called a politician's clock. Why? Because it's two-faced. It's got a face on the other side as well. And they placed it in a window of the transit house so that when the navigators came up from their ships with their chronometers, they could get the time and set their chronometers without going into the transit house and disturbing the astronomer. And he used the other face. Anyway, Wallace was training him initially in mathematics. And by 1824, as we'll see in a moment, Henderson was a very, very accomplished mathematician. And in fact, Henderson wanted to be a mathematician. He didn't actually want to be an astronomer. But after 1825, the training was more in the observational astronomy side. That's the material I've got here. Henderson probably went into the university to get his mathematics. Now, I now want to look at how the heavens work so we can see what he was up to. And we really have to understand what sidereal time is. The word sidereal comes from a Latin root, um, sidea, meaning star. It is literally star time. Um, there are two clocks in the astronomer's life. There's the clock of the stars and the clock that we live by. Let's start the uh, little chat here. There's the sun. Here's the Earth going around its orbit. And we start at this position here. And we've got a marking on the Earth here. It's an arrowhead that's pointing midday to the sun. And the Earth's rotating in this fashion. Now, when the Earth rotated fully 360 degrees, it's moved a little bit around its orbit. And so if we look, that's pointing at the sun, but that isn't. It's actually pointing to the stars. And if there were a star way out here on that line there, it would be seen again on this line here. That's why it's called a sidereal day. That star has had one day of its life. But we aren't pointing at the sun. We have to go a bit further around the Earth's orbit, rotate a little bit further until we see the sun at again at midday. So the solar day is larger than the sidereal day. It's about four minutes. And we have 365 and a quarter days in our year, but the stars have 366 and a quarter. It's an extra rotation. And you can work it out for yourself. It's all the little bits of rotation that the Earth has to do as it goes around on its 365 day journey, and they add up to another rotation of the Earth. Now, let's have a look at side. I want to push sidereal time a little bit harder at you now. Let's imagine that this star up here in the top right hand corner is on the zero line of right ascension. What that means is when it passes Paris, and I've got Paris in for a deliberate reason, that clock in Paris should be reading zero. 
when it passes here, this clock should be reading zero and here, zero again. That's how it works. So let me start it. It comes across, the Paris clock's now started. It started at zero when the star got there. So their sidereal clock is moving in this way. And Greenwich. And finally, when we get to Carlton Hill, I'll stop it on the zero at Carlton Hill. Now, a couple of things here. When we go fly to New York, uh, we look at our watch, which is the watch, we, the clock we live by, and we'll change that by five hours when we go to New York. And we casually say that New York's five hours different on the clock than it is here in Edinburgh. That is technically incorrect. It is sidereal time that determines longitude, not real, not mean time. And so uh, New York, for example, if it were exactly on the meridian, on one of, one of the meridians there, would be five hours behind this exact time here, not one on our watch. There's about 3% difference. So we see here, anyway, the stars arrived at Carlton Hill. We, our clock's now going to be reading zero on its sidereal time. But at Greenwich, it'll be reading 12 minutes and 43 seconds. That's its longitude on Earth with respect to uh, uh, Carlton Hill. And Paris, it's reading 22 minutes and four seconds. Now, here's a question. How do we know when our clock's reading zero here that Greenwich is at 12 minutes and 43 seconds? And it's that long since that star passed Greenwich. There's no phones. There's no telegraph wires in the ground. So we've got to be clever. We've got to be clever. That's why I wanted to show you that little demonstration there. Now let's go into stellar dynamics proper. What we see on the screen here is all excuse of the stars. Me, Bruce, sorry? excuse me. I, I, I'm still looking at the sidereal time and solar mean time on my screen. Gosh. I think you shared the presentation, but rather than your window, Bruce, so we didn't see whatever you were showing us, I think. The explanation was fine. <laughs> Can you see it now? No, I'm still saying that the, the original solar mean time. This worked on the previous talk that I did. Um, did you share the presentation or did you share your screen? I'm screen sharing. Do I want a new share, perhaps? No? Uh, try, try again, I suppose. Try sharing again. I can see it. It looks absolutely correct to me. Well, I should stop sharing and, and restart the, the sharing, Bruce. Hang on. Let's works. try again. Wait a minute. Oh, oh I, did the, I did the wrong one there. Hang on. You got it this time? No? Nope. changed. No. Oh, dear. The presentation is moving slightly, but we're not seeing it, right. anything. Yeah. Well, well, that's the presentation that I changed there. So let's come back to it now. Is that right? No? That's gone back. I briefly, you briefly, I briefly saw oh, a different screen. That's real time. Sorry? I, I briefly saw a different screen, and then it oh. came back to the one you left on. Let's see back in a minute. That's okay. Right. What you're seeing on the screen there is the whole, is all of the stars up to a magnitude of five. And um, in the middle of the screen here, um, sorry, I, I'm going to have to get my brain engaged again here. Uh, it's paused at the moment, but across the screen, there's the whole 24 hours of right ascension. And vertically, there's the whole 180 degrees of declination, plus 90 down to minus 90, and there'll be an equator here. Now, this is the ecliptic, this curved line. And the reason that it's curved is because Although, can you see me on a little um, uh, uh, thumbnail? Yeah. Yeah, because the uh, axis of the Earth is angled at 23 and a half degrees to the ecliptic. But when we do the star maps, we bring it up to the vertical and we unwrap around the vertical. So we're unwrapping around the axis of the Earth. And at that point, the ecliptic is 23 and a half degrees sloping down the way. And it looks like that shape on the pattern of the stars. Now, when I start this running, I'm going to keep 12 minutes, 12, 12 o'clock, sorry, always. And that's that red line there. And we're going to run through all the dates. Okay, 
I add one day repeatedly and redraw it. And that means that we're always at midday and the sun is staying where it is. It moves slightly backwards and forwards over that red line. And that's called the equation of time, but that's not part of tonight's talk, but it's, hu it's hugging that line. But you can see that the stars are inexorably moving to the right there. That's because they are on sidereal time. So if I hit the sidereal button down here in the left, now the stars stop and the sun moves because it's on the other clock now. And you can see that they're frozen. And this is how stellar atlases are made. This is what Henderson was up to. He had a sidereal clock in his observatory. It was running, reading the correct time. And now all he has to do is, as each star comes across the meridian, and he sees it through that transit telescope, he notes the time on his sidereal clock, and he has the right ascension of that star. That's how it all works. And it's all fixed in place by that clock. Now, I want to actually, um, show you some planets now. I want to just complete this story. I'll wait until that comes around to the middle again. Um, so that would be before I whip back the solar, because the planets are a, a bit happier when they're in the middle of the screen. Okay, let's go to solar now, and I'll put the planets on. Now, now uh, what we can see are the planets Going, Mercury is a good one to watch because it, it circles the sun about four and a half times to our, in a year of ours. And you can see it's hugging the sun there. But the other thing that you'll notice about the planets is that they hug the ecliptic, which is why I mentioned what the ecliptic was a moment ago. That's because their orbits, although they're inclined to the ecliptic, they're not big angles. Um, so we see the planets hugging to the ecliptic there. They didn't figure in Henderson's life, really. He did measure, make some measurements of the planets because when you're making atlases, you put all these things in and other people might use them. Now, let me take the planets out and finally show you the moon. Now, the moon is the fastest object in the sky. And that gives it some very interesting properties. One of which is it's been used to measure time because it's so quick. But another one, I'm gonna do a little demonstration here. Uh, the other one is, let me just pause this for a second. It's just gone in front of a star here, we'll see. So every now and again, the moon, and there's gonna be another one up here. Every now and again, the moon goes in front of a star and blocks the starlight. So there, I'll just pause it here. It's about to swallow that star up. And when I resume it, it'll come out the other side. Uh, when the star disappears behind the moon, this is called an occultation. Uh, when the star dis behind, disappears behind the moon, that's called immersion. And when it comes back out again, it's called immersion. Now, um, now we have, going back to the question of how do you check the clocks between Carlton Hill and Greenwich? If there's an occultation and it's viewable in both places, now you can, the astronomer can write down the time on his sidereal clock when each of those two events happened, immersion and immersion. Now we've got a way of comparing the clocks, but it's a bit of a not so fast because the event is not seen at exactly the same time, nor from exactly the same geometry, where 56 degrees north and Greenwich is about 51. So we're looking at a different geometry when we see that. And what that means is you can't just say, the difference between the two clocks at immersion is the difference in longitude. There's a massive calculation in between because the moon me moves. It arrives at Greenwich first and then it's uh, cut until second and it's moved in between the two. So you've got to take account of all sorts of things here. And Henderson did it. Henderson managed to find an algorithm that could fit all of those parameters and tell you what the difference in the clocks were. Now, there were existing algorithms before he came on the scene and was trained by Wallace, but they were all approximations. Henderson came up with a Rolls Royce. Let me just see what other things I've got to show. Uh, let me try and bring up my... Um, um, oh, I've stopped screen sharing again. Uh, let me go back to it. How do I do that? Um, zoom. Oh, 
I've lost the screen again now. Uh... Do an alt tab until you see the application you want, Bruce. Oh, okay. Right. Oh. And what do I do then? I well, I'm holding the alt tab down. I hit it. No. Oh, I've got it now. We can see it again now. You're not. You're not shared yet. Not shared yet. Oh, oh okay. How do I do that? Uh, here. I can't get into the share screen. It doesn't. It doesn't take me into the share screen. It might be hidden somewhere. Uh, now I'm getting. Uh, I've got it now. Are we back in business? Yeah, we're back now. Yep. Slideshow from current slide. Oh no! I want to go down through. We've done some, haven't we? Da -da. Right, we want this one here. Gosh, this is going to be tricky, isn't it? Now, uh, Henderson, the point we got to was that Henderson has discovered a really good algorithm for working out the difference in longitude between two places having seen a lunar uh, occultation. Now, we go to the Nordic Al Almanac now. That's a book that Mariners take to sea because it's got all of the information they need to be safe from crashing into things and getting to where they want to go. Now, Neville Maskelyne was the person that first introduced it. He was the fifth astronomer royal at Greenwich, and he produced the first one in 1766 for the year 1767. But by the time that um, um, Henderson came on the scene, the person handling the nautical almanac was Dr. Thomas Young. You may know of Young by Young's modulus. This guy was. Uh, a polymath, he's a very intelligent man, but he was running the Nautical Almanac. And Henderson wrote to him in 1824 with his algorithm. And Young was so impressed by it that he put it straight into the Nautical Almanac, which is why I've got this front page here, which was published in 1824 for 1827. And uh, in fact, it superseded one that Young had written himself, which means Young was really quite good to the guy. He was, he was right on, on tap. Now, let's go back to how we can find out the difference between long, of, of longitude between two places. And here's an interesting one, simultaneity of time. If your uh, observatories are reasonably close to each other, you can go about halfway between, fire a rocket up into the sky, it explodes with a big flash of light, and each of the astronomers writes down the time on his uh, sidereal clock. And we now know the difference in latitude. Not a very practical solution because you've got to be pretty close together. But that didn't stop John Herschel in 1825, and a chap called Sabine in France, from setting up an experiment to find the difference between Paris and Greenwich in terms of longitude. And you can see what they've done. They've split it down into three areas with rockets, and they've got four lots of clocks. So we've got a clock in Paris here, and another set of people at Ligniers here, and they've got a rocket uh, site on Mont Javo, which is between those two. So both these clocks can see this. And then they've got another set of rockets at La Conche down near the uh, English Channel, and Fairlight down here in Britain, and Fair light down, and Ligniers can see that one, and finally Greenwich and uh, Fair light down can see the one at Rotherham. And what they did was they did an experiment over twelve nights, ten rockets per night from each of those three sites, three hundred and sixty rockets in total. And what they did was at Mont Javo, they said to rocket up every ten minutes after a certain point of time on the on, a, on the ordinary clock, and five minutes later they started them from Lacanche. And that was 10 minutes, so they were interleaved. So the people at Ligniers knew when to look in this direction for a rocket burst and this direction. Same thing with Fairlight Down. These were all running at 10 minute intervals, and these were running at 10 minute intervals interleaved by five minutes. And Herschel went into print in 1826 with an absolute shed load of data. 
It's all in the paper, over 25 pages of it. Now, so they fired the 360 rockets. Not all of them were seen, but also they had to take care of the clocks. It was, no clock is, no mechanical clock is perfect. It's either running slightly fast or slightly slow. And that's called the going. And they measured the going of all their clocks before they started so they could do all the corrections and get this absolutely bang on. And the result was Paris is nine minutes, 21 point seconds east of Greenwich. Now, this is like raw meat to a lion for, for Henderson. He's right into mathematics and he's a very, very careful worker. So he got hold of the paper and he didn't just read Herschel's paper, he checked it. He went through all the working because all the data was there. And what did he find? He found an error of one second somewhere in an intermediate calculation. So he recast the whole paper and it was published in 1827. And what did he find? He found that Paris was nine minutes, 21.46 seconds east of Greenwich and not 0.6 as it was in Herschel's. Now you would think Herschel's gonna get a bit uppity about this, but he wasn't. Um, and he was full of praise for what Henderson had done. And in fact, although I said he published it in 1827, I think he sent it to Herschel and Herschel said, put this in, pub in print, that's fine by me. Now this, when you look back at the historical documents, this is apparently the moment when the world knew that Henderson was an accomplished astronomer. Let's move on to 1828 now. Now, up until this moment in time, we know that Henderson is a consummate mathematician. We don't know anything about his practical observational work. And Wallace was working on that as well. And so I just, there's prior to 1828, we don't know about him other than mathematician. But in 1828, uh, he did have a, under his belt, some of it comes prior to 1828, he did have, an, have under his belt a significant number of observations he had done in that transit house with those instruments. And a paper was published in 1828 with all this in it. But Henderson did not publish that paper. Henderson did not want to be an astronomer. He wanted to be a mathematician. The paper was published by Wallace. So we can see what the mentor is doing now. He's channeling him into astronomy. Doesn't want him in mathematics. I don't know whether they had a big fisticuffs or what, but I think they were both nice blokes actually. Henderson definitely was. So they probably had a bit of back chat, but uh, Wallace said, I'm publishing it. So now we now have a man who is an astronomer. Now, the other thing he did uh, in 1828 was he, created another algorithm, a really, really good algorithm this time, an algorithm that can predict occultations. Now, prior to Henderson stumbling on this algorithm, uh, what astronomers were doing was they were just keeping a watch on the night sky. And if they saw an occultation coming, they thought, oh, I'll measure that one. And if it's Greenwich, they say, I hope that they've got good weather up in Edinburgh and the Stronger up in Edinburgh sees this one as well because then we'll be able to compare results. So it was a bit scattered, scattergun. But now Henderson goes and publishes in late 1828 dates for dates and times for 10 European and UK observatories for 1829 for occultations of the star Aldebaran by the moon. Um, that's the eye of the ball. Now, if we're lucky, we'll see. Can we see that one? Or are you still seeing my slide? Are you, are you seeing this diagram or my slide? Still, still the slide, Bruce. Oh. Hit escape to stop the presentation and see if that helps and then minimize your PowerPoint. I did that earlier, I think, but it didn't work still. Yeah, try, try minimize no, PowerPoint. It locks me out when I do that from doing yeah. my... Um, let me, I'll come back and show you that later, okay? Uh, I've only got one more after that. So I'll go back into the slides and I will show you what he did in 1828 later. It's very important to see actually. So we'll go back to slideshow from current slide, okay? Coming back later when we can change it all. Now, uh, so I was going to show you an occultation, assume you've seen it. 
1829 was a bad year for Henderson because, um, first of all, Robert Blair, who was professor of astronomy at Edinburgh University, died in December 1828. Now, this looks like a golden opportunity for Henderson, and all of his friends saw that. Now, the government refused to give him the job. And in fact, they didn't put anybody in the chair. Uh, unfortunately, Blair, who was a very unpopular character, had cooled the pitch, I think, on astronomy in Edinburgh. He was in a sinecure and he just sat in it doing nothing. He had nothing to do with Carlton Hill. And I don't think anybody liked him. And so the government said, well, we're not having anything to do with this. Secondly, Dr. Thomas Young, the man who's doing the uh, Nordic Almanac, he fell ill in May and he died in about 12 days. Uh, now, he fell ill with an illness that it's not surefire that you would die. A lot of people would fall ill with this illness and come good again. But Thomas Young, when he fell ill, decided to take a punt, I suppose, on whether he was going to die or not. And he wrote a letter and put it in an envelope, only to be off opened on his death. And he died and it was opened. And this letter recommended that the government give the job, his job of nautical, for doing the nautical or Mac to Henderson. And Henderson, I'm sure when Henderson heard this, he was probably jumping through hoops. He wanted a mathematical job. <laughs> but the government gave it to the astronomer royal at Greenwich, a man by the name of John Pond. But Henderson didn't have to wait too long because two years later, we've covered the blue bits, two years later in 1831, this is where he becomes uh, a professional astronomer. The government comes looking for him didn't apply for a job. Um, and they, would you like to go to the Cape of Good Hope and be the astronomer down there? He said, yeah, I'll go to the Cape of Good Hope. Now, this is a really plum job, by the way, because, and in fact, by the way, I don't think he wanted to go, but uh, Wallace convinced him to go because Wallace now sees him becoming, that's right. And it's a, it's a plum job because the Cape of Good Hope was set up by the government to measure the Southern Hemisphere. So we'd have worldwide navigation. And so it's of equal status almost to Greenwich. So he's almost an astronomer royal at this point. He's one step down, but he hated it. He hated being in South Africa completely. Henderson, Henderson's brother, uh, as I've said before, died suddenly uh, of a heart problem when he was 38. Henderson himself didn't have particularly good health. He did have heart problems, which ultimately got him. Um, and I don't think he liked it being, being away from his, um, his beloved Scotland. So he came back to Edinburgh. And this is where he started to use the 100 pounds that he got per annum because he wasn't in a job. And he went into a house in the Mackenzie Place, it was. Mackenzie Place is still there, but the house isn't. Uh, and in the period of time, 1833 to 1844, 34, sorry, he started to analyze the 10,000 measurements that he'd made at the Cape with a view to making a Southern Hemisphere stellar atlas. But he didn't get far through that and he never actually published them in the rest of his life because the government came looking for him again. And he, he never applied for either job that he had. And he was asked to be the Astronomer Royal for Scotland he was a little bit on the sidelines. He didn't want the job, by the way, again, he was on the sidelines, but everybody in Edinburgh who knew him beat a drum right to the government in London. The government said, we want to pick the person that's going to be the Astronomer Royal. And everybody in Edinburgh that knew uh, Henderson, like people like Wallace, and there was Sir um, Thomas Brisbane, and they all shot off to London and camped down there until they bent the government ears enough to appoint Thomas Anderson. He was only 10 years in the slot. He, he, he came in August 1834 into the position and he died in 1844, just over 10 years later, just short of his 46th birthday. And the king, he was appointed by the king to this job. Now, the uh, Edinburgh Astronomical Institution, which was formed in 1811 and took money in from people who joined it, they were the people who owned the observatory in Edinburgh because they built it. But they ran out of money when uh, they built the observatory and the government had to step in and give them the money for the instruments. So there was a, that's why there was a big argument between them and the government about who would go in there, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, when he was given this commission by the king, King William IV, there was a lovely scroll, all signed up and written by the king. It's missing. I've tried for years to find it. I've been all over the place, even got his will. I've got all sorts of things about Thomas Anderson, but I cannot find this scroll. But what the Edinburgh Astronomical Institution did do is they wrote out what's on the scroll, and this is only the first bit of it here, into their minute book, and they took the minute book to the king, and the king signed it for them. So we have got a little bit of evidence there of Henderson. 1838, about four years later, he's back looking at the longitude of Carlton Hill. Now, those of you who, when I said, how would you find out the difference between Greenwich and Carlton Hill in terms of longitude? Those of you who said in your mind's eye, why don't you take a clock between them? Set the clock up in Edinburgh, take it down to Greenwich and see what the difference is. Set the clock up in Greenwich, bring it to Edinburgh and see what the difference is. There's a way of doing it, but it's fraught with difficulty because clock, mechanical clocks are not 100% accurate. And when they're moving, they might have a different going than when they're stationary, all sorts of things. You could jolt the thing. So Henderson being a very, very conservative and careful worker, got hold of 12 clocks, chronometers they're called. Uh, the word chronometer just means very accurate clock. It's usually used in marine terms. He got 12 from a guy called Arnold Dent in London, Arnold and Dent. And he took them to Greenwich, got them all set up with Greenwich time and sailed them up to Edinburgh by ship, brought them up onto Carlton Hill and compared them, all 12 of them, with the time in Carlton Hill. He did various other experiments that I don't want to go into right now. We've lost a bit of time as well. But eventually, of course, they were taken back to Greenwich. And then they were checked against the Greenwich clock when they got back. This gave Henderson a huge amount of data. And Henderson loved data. And he plowed through all this data, looking at errors and all sorts of things and transportation, the goings of the clocks, the lock, lock, stock and barrel. And he worked out that the longitude of Edinburgh was 12 minutes, 42.99 seconds west of Greenwich. 20 years later, the second astronomer royal at Carlton Hill, Charles Patsy Smythe, decided to find the longitude of Carlton Hill a different way. Because by 1858, there was a telegraph line between Edinburgh and London. And he got a wire up to the Carlton Hill and they got a wire down to Greenwich at the other end. And so he could push a little key, uh, there was a battery attached to it, push a little key in Edinburgh and a little mark was put on a sheet of paper in a, in a drum down at Greenwich and the same thing coming the other way. So they could now actually push a button when the star came over and instantaneously Greenwich would know because it was on their drum. And the answer he got was 1 20th of a second larger than this one. It was 12 minutes 43.04 or something. So I think we can say that Henderson did a pretty good job there. And let me come to Henderson's legacy now uh, of what I've said so far. 10,000 plus observations at the Cape of Good Hope. Unfortunately, I don't think they've ever been published. 60,000 in the 10 years he was on Carlton Hill. That's the same as I said uh, a couple of months ago for uh, James Bradley at, uh, at Greenwich. So Henderson's up there with the big ones. Over 70 published papers, five volumes of astronomical observations made at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Improved mathematical methods for lunar occultations, accurate determination of the long, longitude of Carlton Hill. Now on the point of the astronomical observations, for those of you who are new to this, these are quite valuable books. It's a series that Henderson started. And here's the flyleaf of volume one. And it contains all of his measurements, observations from 18, October 1834 through to December 1835 after which he did one per year. And he'd done five of his 10 years at the time of his death. The incoming Piazzi Smythe did the other five after he came, so all 10 have been published. And the last one in the series, and then and, and Piazzi Smythe kept this series running, and the last one in the series is volume 15, which Piazzi Smythe wrote in 1886 for the years 1878 to 1886. He resigned in 1888. And there's 15 volumes there, 
And they're well worth a read if you really want to go through the history of this. This is the real McCoy, as written by Henderson and as written by Piazzi Smythe. And you can get them on this website if you can actually, we can probably publish this website or if you freeze it if you, uh, at some point and look at that, uh, at that address. All of them are there except volume 15, which is quite thick and it's full of numbers. So they only actually scan the first few pages of it. Now, I said there was his legacy, but that wasn't his entire legacy. There's a question that we can ask ourselves, how big is the universe? And when Henderson came on the scene, nobody knew how big the universe was because nobody had ever measured the distance to a nearby star. And at this moment of time, I was going to show you my parallax demonstration, which I showed in the Speed of Light talk. But what we're trying to do here is to watch a small movement in a nearby star against the backdrop of stars and prove that it's parallax. And we have to observe it for at least one year. Now, interestingly, Henderson was at the Cape for 14 months. So he had 14 months worth of data in the 10,000 measurements that he had. And I got the most of the information for this bit of the talk from Professor Brian Warner, who's Professor of Astronomy at the University of Cape Town. Now, Brian Warner is very interested in history. And in particular, he's interested in uh, Henderson because Henderson was part of the history in his neck of the woods down in uh, Cape Town. And he actually came to Britain and he went to, uh, came to Edinburgh in fact, and looked on Blackford Hill to get lots of information. He went to Greenwich, got some information and he wrote a book and he shared some of his secrets with me when I was doing this. Um, most of them were in print, but uh, he was quite kind to me. Previous attempts to measure parallax all ended in failure, but we know of one of them from a couple of months ago, 1725 to 28, James Bradley, third astronomer at Greenwich, made systematic measurements, but they led to the discovery of aberration of light and were not parallax related. But they proved Copernicus, which is another thing that parallax does. But unfortunately for Henderson, and this is really key because Henderson was a very conservative person. Unfortunately, in 1815, John Brinkley, the Astronomer Royal for Ireland, went into print claiming stellar parallax. John Pond was asked to check this at Greenwich, and it was false. And Brinkley's reputation never recovered from this error of judgment. Now, Henderson would have known this, and Henderson was conservative, and it comes into play, as we'll see shortly. Alpha Centauri, that's the star we're heading for. It's the closest star to Earth. Well, there's, a, there's one called Proxima Centauri, which is slightly closer, but Alpha Centauri is the key one. Salient history. Henderson was at the Cape for 14 months. That's long enough to detect parallax. And so if this star are exhibiting parallax and he has enough data, he's going to be on the money here. And the, the history of it is that in 1833, this was the last year that Henderson was there. He left in about May. So he must have got this letter about January from Manuel Johnson. He wrote to Thomas Henderson informing him that Alpha Centauri had a high space motion. I think he's talking proper motion here. The theory was amongst astronomers that if you had a star that had a high space motion, that is a high proper motion, it's probably close to us. So it might have parallax as well. Manuel Johnson is an interesting character. Um, he went on to become professor at Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember which one. But at the time, Manuel Johnson was running an observatory on St. Helena Island. And he, he was part of the group of people that was guarding uh, Napoleon. And Manuel Johnson, when he was sent there, he was quite young. He was absolutely bored out of his skull. And somebody showed him an, uh, a telescope and he built an observatory on St. Helena Island. And he was a very accomplished astronomer. And that's why he'd seen it and sent this letter to uh, Henderson. So finding suitable stars for measuring parallax was what I just said there. You look for a high space motion, it might have parallax. And so there's evidence now that Henderson stepped up his observations of Alpha Centauri during the last two months at the Cape. So he's onto something here now, or he thinks he is. And he comes back to Edinburgh, starts plowing through his 10,000 observations to build this uh, stellar atlas. But he also looked at his data for Alpha Centauri, of course. And on the 14th of June, 1834, 
he wrote a letter to Thomas McClear, who was his successor at the Cape. And I, it's very difficult to read this writing. He's got beautiful handwriting, by the way, but this is one of the poorest uh, examples of his handwriting. But what he's saying in here to Thomas McClear is, hey, Alpha 1 and Alpha 2 Centauri, it's a double star, look pretty good. And I think they've got parallax. Could you check it for me? But McClear didn't make any attempt to do this for some reason we don't know. Why was he asking McClear to recheck it? Henderson must be the unluckiest person in history because the instrument on which he was making these measurements, which was a mural circle, had a flaw. The axle of the mural circle was slightly flawed. And that meant you had to worry about the readings that you got from it. Now, these mural circles had micro microscopes in six places around the perimeter of them so that wherever you turned it to to see the star, you could always see two or three of these things. Some of them would be hidden down the bottom. Um, but you could actually get the answer on two or three of them. But Henderson had discovered that if he took all six microscopes and got the numbers off all six and did an average, he probably had the right answer. So Henderson must have been pretty super confident that he had the right answer here. But after he left the Cape, they took a really good mural circle from Greenwich, took the one out of the Cape and put the good one in. So McClear had one that could have got the right answer, but for some reason he didn't do the measurements. And all was lost because in 1838, Bessel in Germany announced to the world that he'd measured the parallax of a Northern Hemisphere star called 61 Cygni. Now, 61 Cygni is about four times further away from the Earth than is Alpha Centauri. So he was measuring an absolutely minuscule movement on this star. But at that period in history, uh, Germany had superior instruments to what we had. And they had a thing called the heliometer, which could measure the tiniest of tiny movements. And he used a heliometer to get this. So we've lost. But Henderson didn't waste any time. Uh, he said, right, I've got the right answer. I know it's right now because there is parallax. And so he pumped, went into print on the 24th of December, 1838, just a couple of months after um, Bessel. And given that there were no new measurements from the Cape, well, he would have to have had 12 months worth. Uh, it's nothing to do with anything that McClear did. And he went to present the paper at the Royal Astronomical Society in London on the 3rd of January, 1839. So Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel received the Royal Astronomical Society's gold medal for being the first person to publish evidence of parallax in a nearby star. But as Brian Warner quotes, and he gave me this quote, the first observations containing evidence of a measurable stellar parallax were made by Thomas Henderson at the Cape of Good Hope in 1832-33. So he came second but he should have come first. He had it five years earlier. Little finale here, actually. Um, I've read quite a lot of stuff up on Blackford Hill, plowed through a lot of stuff about uh, Henderson. And as I said before, the observatory itself was owned by what are people that were called the proprietors. They're the people who put the money in up front to get it built. And this chap jeweler, James Mackay was one of them. To get the biggest access to the uh, observatory, he had to put in 25 guineas, I think it was. Um, so he put in the big amount of money and you're allowed to go into the observatory. So he says here, and I quote from his letter, as a proprietor, I always considered I had a right to enter the observatory and take a friend with me. And when I availed myself of the privilege, I was always kindly received by the late professor and shown through the instruments, any of the planets I desired. I was as cordially received as if I had been deeply informed on the subject and I will never forget the simplicity and unpretending way in which he conveyed his knowledge. He was a thorough gentleman, was Thomas Anderson, and very conservative at that, and a very hard worker. And he got world stage status as well. This is what the Royal Astronomical Society said at his death. His publications have conferred on the observatory a high reputation among similar institutions in Europe. And on the last slide is my quote, we can conclude that under Thomas Henderson's directorship, Carlton Hill was the equal of such august establishments as the Royal Observatory of Greenwich. And here, down the bottom here, is the monument that's on the observatory itself. 
put there by Charles Piazzi Smythe. And here is his gravestone, which is in the graveyard at uh, Greyfriars. And that's the end of that. So let me come out of that and see if we can get into what I want to show you now. I'll probably lose the screen for a second or two. Uh, let me just share my screen again. Uh, it's this one I want. Uh, right, this is what I wanted to show you. Henderson went into print in 1828, as I said, having used a formula that he created, an algorithm to predict lunar occultations. Unfortunately, this, this, this one pertains to October 1829. Unfortunately for Henderson, he was biting his fingernails off in Edinburgh because it was cloudy. But down at Greenwich, there were six astronomers down there with telescopes and clocks waiting for this to happen. And Henderson had said that the star would disappear behind the moon. You can see the moon is the same shape. This is all just, this whole thing here has been done mathematically directly from all the algorithms that I created from a book that I read. Uh, so you can see the moon's in the same position here. Henderson said the star would disappear at this point here and reappear here. Okay, so let's see what happens. It stops automatically when it gets to the star. That's Aldebaran. And we'll come up with some answers down the bottom here when it hits there. Okay, that's immersion. That's the star going behind the, the moon. Henderson predicted 22 hours and 48 minutes on, of sidereal time. He didn't do the seconds, which is a pity because when the six people down in Greenwich saw it and averaged all their times out, they got 22, 48, 27.8, less than 30 seconds wrong. And I wish he'd put some seconds in there. Uh, Henderson said it was going to be at uh, 292 degrees. Nought degrees would be at the top here, 90, 180, 270, 290. Uh, and it was at 290 that, that the uh, people at Greenwich saw it. Now let's continue it to see how he did with the, immer with the immersion, which is the other end of it which is going to be in the black bit here. <clears throat> and it's looking good when it comes. So there's naught degrees there. You can see it's quite a small angle. He said that immersion was going to be at 23 hours 25 on the sidereal clock. And it was at 23 hours 25, 35.7 seconds. So that's really bad. He's more than 30 seconds out there. Um, and it was an angle of 014 and he predicted 12. I can't remember which way around these two are, but you can see they're very close. That is how good his algorithm was and how careful a worker he was when he wanted to actually say and do something. And that brings me, I think, to the end. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce. Perhaps we could unmute and uh, show our thanks. <laughs> Excellent, Bruce, as ever. Um, do we have any questions? There's none come up on the uh, on the chat, um, but if anybody has any, uh, fire away. Or perhaps you've uh, you've been very comprehensive, as always, Bruce. And uh, I, I I call it the hidden history of Edinburgh. Nobody knows about this. <laughs> you know? And so when you say it for the first time, people would say, "Oh, is that what he did?" Hmm. Yeah. Why do you think he doesn't get the acclaim he should do? Because Piazzi Smy was was a bit of a, a crank in many ways, so he got maybe all the all, all the the plaudits. But Henderson was obviously just a quiet man. He got on with his job, I suppose. I couldn't agree more with you, actually. And very interesting thing about this is that I studied Henderson first, and if I were to be honest with you, I had a bit of a look at Piazzi Smythe and I thought, oh, there's a scattergun. <laughs> he's he's just nowhere, you know. And I couldn't see who he was. And so I went down the Henderson route, big style, and um, came up with, and that's the second time I've given that talk, actually. The first time I was in the library in town. Um, and then they asked me to do Piazzi Smythe, and I knew a bit about Piazzi Smythe at this point in time. And I said, okay, I'll do Piazzi Smythe. Well, about a week later, my desk had books all over it because Piazzi Smythe was so busy. Now, I kind of ruled him out because I thought he was a scattergun, the interesting thing about Piazzi Smythe is everything he does, he goes down to a depth. There's a big list, but he goes down to a depth. 
very difficult to an uh, analyze. And so the two are entirely different people. And I agree with what you said. They came at the right time in history, incidentally, because if Patsy Smythe had come first, it would have been a whole different ballpark when Henderson came. But Henderson got that mm -hmm. thing up and running, got it on the world stage, and Patsy Smythe kept it running. And thankfully, we've still got a world stage Royal Observatory of Edinburgh today. And in part, I think that comes from what Henderson and Patsy Smythe did. They put it on the world stage. And some people wanted to keep it there, even though the government was going to shut it down. Well, maybe, Andrew, we should be honouring Thomas Henderson more in the society, would you think? <laughs> <laughs> I'd go along with that. <laughs> uh, any more questions for everybody? I was just going to make a comment. Um, as the international representative down in London, um, Robert Hooke, of course, started to look for this, the parallax, in 1669. Yes. Um, just following the Great Fire of London. Mm. And in fact, those who've been down to London and seen the monument to the fire, Great Fire of London just by north of London Bridge, he built a teles He had to build that monument, but built a telescope inside it um, to try and look for, I can't reach the star, was it Beta Draconis or something? No, it was uh, Gamma, yeah, Gamma Draconis, sorry, yeah. Actually, it should be Beta. It's actually brighter than Beta. I think Alan can probably put us right here. Uh, but once it's got the name, it's kept it. Yes. No, he, um, but of course, the problem was that the telescope tube was built out of Portland stone mm -hmm. and heated up on one side quite nicely in the sunshine, but then spent the whole night bending back again, apparently. <laughs> so it was a fairly um, useless telescope in that way. So there's the motto don't build your telescope out of Portland stone. Yeah. And, but only, in any case, he would only have found the aberration of light if that had worked, because yes. it was Gamma Draconis he was looking at. Yes. But it's an interesting bit of history. <laughs> uh. okay, but I, I thought the point you were going to make was the game started in 1669, but it wasn't closed off until 1838. No. We knew that Copernicus was right when um, Bradley did his speed of light. But yeah. we didn't know what the size of the universe was, or we had no way of getting to the size of the universe until 1838. And of course, the other thing that's quite interesting is only relatively recently they found out the line of zero longitude at Greenwich is wrong. Um, because the Royal, um, the Ordnance Survey, apparently, was it, I can't remember which was the first transit telescope in Greenwich. The Ordnance Survey have always used that as a reference. There was apparently an international conference that said it had to move to, I think, the Bradley Transit Instrument, and the Ordnance Survey never did. So the Ordnance Survey is actually 20 or 30 feet out from the proper zero longitude. I don't know that bit of history, but I know what you're talking about, because each astronomer royal that came in moved it across a bit when he put his instruments in. Yes. Uh, Alan, do you know what, whether that's the case? Microphone. No, <laughs> that is a short answer. <laughs> I'll see if I can find the references a bit on the IAU website, I think. No, I think you're probably right. There is something funny at, at, at Greenwich. I do know that, but I haven't taken it up in detail. No, well, it's even funnier now, of course, because the zero um, longitude of GPS is about 100 metres to the east. And so everyone come, all the visitors, when we used to have them, came along. My GPS says I'm not on the zero longitude guy. <laughs> and it's taken ages to try and explain to them. Well, I don't think anyone ever has, has ever explained to them what the difference is between the GPS zero longitude and the zero longitude in Greenwich. It's because um, Ordnance Survey surveyed the whole of the UK in a particular way. I actually got involved in this because I did some GPS work tracking vehicles. Um, the GPS does works on something called WGS84. Yeah, yeah. So it imposes a systematic uh, latitude and longitude around the earth, yes. and it does that as well. But it doesn't map exactly onto the way in which Ordnance Survey did it. Yeah. And Ordnance Survey have an algorithm that you can put into your software, which I was using at the time, um, that actually moves it to the, the grid that the Ordnance Survey was using. Yes. So you do your WGS84, 
and then you apply this algorithm and it takes takes it to the exact place on an ordnance survey map Yes, I think it was actually Gilbert Sasserthwaite, who was, of course, the last observer using the transit circle at Greenwich, made the last observation accidentally. Um, he said that they actually found this discrepancy when they were surveying um, the location of Hurstmanso, because obviously they had to know where Hurstmanso was relative to Greenwich. And oh, come back, Thomas Henderson, all is forgiven. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We'd have worked it for them. <laughs> Was there anything on um, YouTube, Mike? No, no, it's quiet on YouTube. A few people there, but it's quiet. Okay, any any more questions? Bruce, did um, Charles Piazzi Smith and uh, Tom Henderson know each other? Did they have dealings together? No, uh, sorry, I can't see who's talking. No, no, he 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 didn't. And that's why I was saying at the very beginning that little image you see that people will tell you is Tom Henderson. Yeah. Uh, Patsy Smythe got that drawn. Uh, he drew drew several images and got people to point to the one that looked like Thomas Henderson. And so we don't really know what Thomas Henderson looked like. And he died so suddenly at the age of 45. So he hadn't really been in the game long enough to have one of these lovely portraits done. And so we have no knowledge of him at all, which is slightly interesting. One of the things I find interesting is that Rock House, which is right beside the observatory, was where all the early Photography was being done by, I can't remember the two, two guys' names now, somebody. I'm surprised they didn't come across the wall and photograph the observatory. There's very few photographs of that observatory at the time that uh, photography was growing. And Rock House is right next door. Great. Um, any more for any more? Well, again, well, thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, excellent talk. Um, um, say thank you again. Absolutely. Uh, we look forward to the next one. Thank you. <laughs> it, looks like, oh, it looks like I'm going to have to do something. Strange to relate, that last talk I did when it did work was on my laptop, and this is my newer machine, so there might be an incompatibility there because it worked on the laptop, and I just assumed it would work here. But we got there in the it's all magic to me, so. Oh. <laughs> the thing is that there were two programs running, Andrew. A program that I wrote to do all those demonstrations and PowerPoint. And I shared the PowerPoint screen and it wouldn't talk to my program. <laughs> and then when I shared the program, I couldn't talk to PowerPoint. And that was what the problem was. I'll trim it out of the video, Bruce. Don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> oh, great, great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. Um, just a reminder, next Friday, um, it's uh, Professor David uh, Waltham on Is Earth Special? So that sounds, uh, sounds interesting. I'm interested to know what he thinks. <laughs> and I uh, look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you very much. Thank you.